Good evening. Are you a believer or not? That is the question we're tackling tonight on the programme. And I'm not referring to religion. I'm talking, of course, about climate change, a subject which is hugely important for all of us. Are we taking the threat seriously and what are the consequences if we don't? Joining us to discuss this are John Gibbons, environmental journalist and commentator, Cara Augustenberg from Friends of the Earth, Eamon Ryan, the Green Party TD, and John McGurk, communications consultant. So if you'd like to comment on the programme, you can text us at 53131 and place the word tonight before your comment. Or if you'd like to send us a tweet, it's at hash vinb, or just email us at tonight at tv3.ie. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start with the teaser question for 10 points. Who said the following? Global warming is bull and a hoax. And another person recently told us that God above controls the weather. And he added, he doesn't agree with all this stuff about climate change. So, who said the first? Donald Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> well <laughs> done. And who said the second one? Danny Healy Ray. Well done to both of you. Right, Cara, now down to the serious <laughs> business. Can I ask, just to give the viewers at home, what do you believe is a thumbnail sketch of what climate change is? And can I add global warming into it as well? Sure. Uh, so climate is our weather over time. And as a result of global warming, which is basically the cause of climate change, our climate is changing. So the Earth's temperature is rising dramatically. It has been rising dramatically as a result of the Industrial Revolution and as a result of the greenhouse gases we've been putting into the atmosphere. And that warming of the Earth is causing a change in our climate and disruption of our weather patterns. So are climate change and global warming interchangeable? I would say that global warming is the cause of climate change. Climate change is the effect. John, can I ask you just to, again, to finish off for the viewers at home, El Nino, should it be in the discussion about global warming and climate change? El Nino and La Nina are two parts of a, a cycle, uh, a natural weather cycle that, that originates in the Pacific. And we've just come out of an El Nino phase. And an El Nino phase means we're going to get an additional warming burst. We can track these and the La Nina delivers a cooling phase. Now, it's worked out that in the current sequence, the El Nino effect in 2015 added approximately 10% to the climate uh, signal that we saw in 2015. So it's, it's relevant, but the main driver of the record temperatures we saw in 2015 is climate change. El Nino is being completely, even though it's a very strong underlying signal, it's been completely overwhelmed by the climate signal. Eamon Ryan, in fact, you said the, the strong signals about uh, climate change and the, the heat in the earth for, for last year. But this year, NASA says it's, the temperature is the highest that it's ever been. Is the evidence really there that we have climate change? And what, is, what would be the number one pointer to it? Number one I'd be looking at is temperature, and it is. It's, as you say, with the 14th month in a row where it's a record temperature, and yes, 2016 is going to be a record year, as was 2015, as was 2014. This has been a consistent, but at the moment it's playing out pretty much exactly as scientists say. If anything, it's on the more alarming in terms of the temperature rise. More this alarming. Year. This year, the temperature rise in particular, and, and measures that they're really looking at, that they're really kind of concerned about, is the likes of the melt of the Arctic sea ice. Because the risk on that, and there's latest analysis by some of the best scientists, Jim Hansen and others, that when you lose the sea ice, you lose the, it increases the heating effect because you've sunlight hitting, rather than hitting white ice that reflects back the heat, you're hitting the sea. And, and some people now predicting within a relatively short period of time, we'd be free of sea ice in the summer in the Arctic. Uh, and I think those are the measures. Uh, the third one maybe of very much relevance to Ireland is what's that effect that's having on the jet stream on the Northern Hemisphere particularly, different patterns of how the jet stream, there are loads of examples, it's highly complex. Uh, it varies. Highly complex. Yes, okay. but the modelling and what the scientists say would happen is coming to pass. John McGurk, are you a sceptic or do you agree with them? Well, in the sense that the climate changes, I don't disagree. I come from Monaghan, known as the Drumland County, because our hills were formed by glaciers. So at one point, this, 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 this uh, country was an awful lot colder. But Eamon mentioned Jim Hansen, how what Jim Hansen says will happen in the Arctic. In 1986, when I was two years old, Jim Hansen told the New York Times that the world will be two degrees warmer by, than it was then by 2006. In 1988, Jim Hansen told the New York Times that by 2008, the Upper West Side of New York would be underwater. In 1989, Michael Oppenheimer, who authored... Yes, people get change. things wrong, Charlie. 
people that do mean things wrong. People do think get things wrong. In 2005, the United Nations said that by 2010, there'd be 50 million refugees globally as a result of climate change. People absolutely get things wrong. There are economists in this country who got things wrong in 2008, said that we'd have a soft landing, and we don't take them seriously anymore. If any other group of people got things so wrong, so often, with such consistency, as people predicting climate change disaster do, they'd be laughed out of time. And if people at home doubt me, just ask themselves for how long in their lives have they been told that we've five years left to okay, save the world. Okay, John, can the, the science be trusted? Absolutely. If we don't trust the science, Charlie, really, you have to ask yourself what's the alternative to um, accepting the broad consensus. And the scientific consensus here, uh, absolutely contrary to what John has suggested, is rock solid. Every national academy in the world from the US to France to articles from newspapers 25 years ago, advances our understanding not a whit. Lots of people, John included, say all kinds of things. But to suggest that climate change and the science of climate change is anything other than robust is, is, is a caricature. Cara, Cara, can I ask you a question? Sure. I mean, in one sense, John is, is skeptic, but if you look at the Republican Party in the United States, it's not some small clique of people. Um, Paul Ryan. Uh, John Boehner, yeah, Trump, they all, I mean, you know, practically all of the leadership of the Republican Party in the United States yeah, are climate skeptical. And right now, Louisiana has experienced its eighth 500-year flood event in 12 months. You know, we have 13 villages in Arctic Alaska that have decided to relocate because they can't live there anymore as a result of melting permafrost. We've had the wettest winters on record, the stormiest winters on record. So climate change is happening right now, right here. And the people who are arguing against climate action, you have to ask why. Why are they trying to maintain so the status the quo at yeah. our expense? Yeah, Beginnings of the blink of an eye in the geological time frame. Secondly, so, sorry, Don, I'll, fin I'll finish this point before you come back in. The, the reason people are skeptical is John said, this is me cherry picking quotes, and he said there's a scientific consensus. The scientific consensus has been the same for 30 years. And the scientific consensus for 30 years has been, we have to do something immediately or the world will be doomed in five years. And for 30 years, the scientific consensus has been utterly and completely wrong. Scientific right. consensus this is goes back to Amen. Yeah, scientific Amen. Cons cons consensus goes back to Charles Tyndall. Um, based on car, it is as the people said as certain as as gravity. The specific you reason. What is the what is to be gained, John, in terms of to, to the Irish people, or in in terms of questioning that science? Bring, what are you? Why do you want to call into question the actual science? And what's your alternative science? Okay. What uh, makes you think you know better than Tyndall or just about every single physicist, yeah. meteorologist that you're to right? And they're all you asked You asked me two separate questions, and I'll answer them both. Both. The reason that uh, I went back 30 years specifically, because that's how long we've been talking about climate change in the context of global warming. In the 1970s, everyone knows that the scientists were talking about a sustained period of global cooling as a result of human activity, and they were wrong about that. Now, you asked me why am I questioning the science, and that was done on the basis of predictions that you buy into. And you say, why do I question the science? It's because you use that science to advance disastrous policies that hurt the poor and satisfy your middle class base who want to believe in this stuff to make themselves John Gibbons. I think to understand the points that John is trying to make here, you, you, you need to look really back to the Republican Party that you, you introduced a few minutes ago. 10 and 15 years ago, studies were done in the US, back, at, back in the early 2000s. And what they found at that time was that science literate Republican interests, particularly the energy industry, politicized the science behind climate change. And what that meant is everyone then went into, their, went into their, their, their boroughs, if you like. And suddenly it became, for people who regard themselves as conservatives and in the US Republicans, it became an article of faith that in order to be a proper conservative, you had to reject climate science. Now, at the moment, the connection, conservatives, their, their objection to abortion is second only in the US to their objection to the science well, of climate change. Well, let's stick to climate change. I mean, listen, Senator, I think the way he's the chairman of the Environmental Committee. But interestingly, Charlie, we know he might think that God controls the weather, but we know who controls Jim Inhofe. He's a recipient into millions of dollars of funding from can, can, the, indus okay. from the energy industry. Yeah, and I, the sorry, I just want to say one thing. The viewers at home, if you want to make a comment or you want to ask the panel a question, you should tweet us at hash vinb or text us at 53131 because I do want your questions to the panel on this issue. W yes. for the Irish people in doing that, that there's a better economic model, a different economic model to the re Republican market knows best model you seem to want to follow.
there are reasons why we need to take action in climate as well as the, the science and the moral reason. We as a country import 85% of our energy. That does not make economic sense for us. It is better for us to develop our own power. We have some of the best re, 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 renewable power uh, re, resources in the world and we can turn to that. We save people money by being more efficient in government and by being a huge investment in making people's homes warmer and better. And if we go and tackle climate change based on good economic arguments, I don't believe that you're in touch with where the real economy is going in the rest of the world. The major investments, every government is saying that is the way to go. Why should we believe and listen to you want to go backwards to some oil dependent system that exposes our country to risk and costs us far more? Eamon, I'm not going to take lectures from you about where the economy is going, given your record in government. But I will say this. If we end up with the economic case for changing the climate model. J John wrote in 2010 in the Irish Times, he wrote an article. In that article, he said that by 2015, peak oil would have overwhelmed the economy. He said, well, peak oil is on the Irish. Okay, you better answer that. Hold on, hold on. I wasn't yeah, just, yeah. I wasn't okay. just throwing yeah. it at him. No. There's a specific reason no. for it. The, the specific reason is that the economic case for, for littering the country with unsightly windmills well, is based on the We're going to come to the windmills in a few minutes. Oil prices are going to soar. We're going to come to the windmills later. Given that I wrote the article, I have a pretty good recollection of it. And again, John is doing the old trick of selective misquotation. To suggest that I said that we were having economic collapse in 2015 is another hilarious misrepresentation. Now, John, I want to congratulate us having okay, a discussion, yeah. Charlie, about climate change. Okay. And Play I hope ball, you, John, as the moderator, the will move us on to an actual discussion about climate change and give John a break uh, from his conspiracy oh. theorising. Oh, okay, I, I, well, listen, we're going to take a break the there and we'll be back Google. in a few moments. There's nothing I love more than leaving the house to spend a free. It's not rocket science, it's pocket science. Appliances delivered.ie. Why pay more? Sport should be for everyone. Not just a special few. We're setting sports free. Air Sport Channels. The Premier League, Champions League, Europeans Cup. Allianz Leagues, GAA, and much more. All total free with our new air broadband bundles. For 1 800 500 300 to set sport free. My dad is a crashy black belt ninja warrior. Well, my dad. Believable Super 6 offers. Visit Aldi. Well, my dad can turn invisible. Hi, Dad. Economic forecast, more like. Just look at them. Let's go crazy. Give me fun, give me flavour, give me crunch. Cadbury Crunchy for the mouth that craves that Friday feeling. Obey your mouth. Welcome back. We're discussing climate change. And one of our tweeters, Mark Malone, said the question should be posed not just as climate change, but rather climate justice. Do you accept that? Yeah, uh, if you like, the, the drivers of climate change, which is principally consumption and carbon dioxide output, are very much in the global north. So, and this is something Mary Robinson has pointed to as well, that climate change is really a global justice issue, and it's also a global inequality issue. In the last 20 or 30 years, global inequality has increased dramatically. And this, in turn, is underpinning and, and feeding the fire that is driving climate change, where we're, we're getting excessive consumption, particularly in the, in the northern hemisphere. And the people who are picking up the tab from this are in the southern hemisphere. And it's interesting, for example, uh, a statistic that I have here from Latin America and Africa on climate change. So the people who, while we might be having these arguments in Europe and America, is it real, is it this, is it a conspiracy? The people who are living with the direct impacts of climate change right now are the most vulnerable people in the global south. But Cara, the people who really have to deal with this issue are the international community, are the big countries. China, India, 
the United States. I mean, on the international front, is enough being done in this area? Well, I mean, I think the big countries are starting to do a lot. I mean, U.S. and China gas emissions by 38, 40 percent. So not enough, obviously. It won't keep us below China's two, two to degrees. China's their increase. They're not decreasing. They're slowing their increase. They are closing down their coal plants. They're slowing their increase. They They're are still going to increase their carbon emissions over the next. Planning to reduce their emissions. Why are you welcoming something? You say emissions are damaging the environment. No. China but is will planning they, to sorry, increase I mean, its will emissions. Will they keep their commitments? This is, I mean, you know, you can ha we had this big conference in Paris last year. It was covered yeah. by everybody. Yeah. But, you know, will it actually deliver in yeah. five years' time, in ten years' time? Will it deliver anything? Yeah, but China's investing more than Europe. China's going in this direction full steam, as is America. California is going to be 50% renewable power in 15 years. So is Germany. The world is, and they're the manufacturing centers of the world. So the world economy is going in this direction. We have a choice. Do we want to be part of that? Or do we want to miss out? Do we want to stick with an old fashioned, out of date and inferior fossil fuel economy? That's the choice facing. We've, and this kind of notion that we won't do anything until China does, or, or, or we should hold back, or we don't count. But Eamon, you know, in America, the, the presidential campaign us. in America, are both presidential candidates now not beginning to roll back on, on fossil fuel? I mean, in Pennsylvania, maybe giving more money. It is a new in, in the industrial revolution. We as a country have a choice. Do we want to be part of it? And we have every reason to lead it. We have every reason to be good at it. We have every reason to, to gain it. Or do we want to say, no, sorry, make Ireland exception. Count us out on this new in, in industrial revolution. That would be such a mistake as what's happening because people are listening to the likes of John no, no, rather I'm than actually listening to the sense and, and understanding what's really people, happening in the world. People John. aren't sceptical of you because they listen to me. People are sceptical skeptical of you because they listen to you. The issue here, Eamon, is that your policy is, you said, you know, California and, and Germany, Britain and Germany are moving through renewable China. energies. And what's happening in those countries is the erosion of the industrial base. And the industrial base is where it's going. It's going to India. It's going to China. It's going to parts of the Far East where they're China's, still building. China's, where invest, there's, China's China, investing more. Than, than Europe China, in this transition. That, that, is, that, is, that is the excuse that no. you had say when I said, which you say are causing the problem, India dramatically increasing its carbon emissions, which you say is causing the problem, him calling it climate justice, and all that's happening is the jobs are moving but from the, the West to the, went, uh, to the you, Far East. And that's went, why people don't want John, a bit of it, John, because it's John, destroying you went, industries. John, John, you went back five years and said 2010, John said something. In 2010, the price of solar power in those last six years has fallen by about 70%. That's why the transition is happening. There's a revolution taking place. People are putting together a digital revolution with a, with a clean energy re uh, revolution. We as a country can be good at digital and can be good at, at clean energy. Why would we give up that opportunity? What, wo what would your alternative future be? What would you have us in, in, invest in? Why would you disagree with every leading company, every leading economic advisor out there who's saying this is the way to go? To do what? First to, of all, to John, John, I agree in John, John, John. Um, there were two aspirations that came out of uh, COP. Uh, one was uh, to keep below the two degrees centigrade um, threshold, the red line as it's called. At the moment, the best advice we have on that is that on current trajectory, following business as usual, we're going to slam through uh, two degrees centigrade by 2036. That's just 20 years out. We're going to break through the other uh, COP target of 1.5, probably within seven or eight years. What now, does that mean for the... I heard some, some interesting commentary about 1970 earlier, but I'll just give you a statistic. Between 1970 and 2010, the total mass of wild vertebrates in the world, in other words, pretty much all the wildlife in the world, declined in that period, 1970 to 2010, by 52%. What this is, this is the impact of untrammeled human industrial expansion, careless pollution and climate change, driving species to oblivion. I was in primary school in 1970. My kids are in primary school now. In 40 years' time, when they're my age, what is going to be left of the world. We get that somebody other than Mr. McGurk will get an opportunity. Maybe our scientist would actually like to comment on this. Cara, can I ask you about what about nuclear power? <laughs> would it not help? Um, I think there's issues with nuclear power around the waste disposal and the justice issues in terms of like, well, we really feel we need community ownership of our renewable energy systems, and that doesn't tend to happen in large scale nuclear. Um, there's a lot of cost and risk implications with nuclear that we haven't resolved yet. So. It's not the ideal solution. What, what do you think about, Eamon, about nuclear power? The best judge of it is, is what the British have done. They've scoured the world trying to get the best, cheapest deal. 
and it's about twice the price of our renewable power alternative and it's they have they have to give a guarantee subsidy of a billion a year for 35 years so on cost terms alone it ain't going to be work and also the way this the way it's looking like it's going but firstly we concentrate well, on we're still building new um, nuclear power we have a real advantage. We have a viable path, not just in energy, but in transport and in food it is, and in our waste system. It is by being efficient. It is by being productive. It is a better economic model to the alternative presented here, which is waste and burn and forget about what's happening in the rest of the world. Look, what about, OK, so what you're talking about is solar and wind. I think a combination of a fit in, in the energy side, it will be an electrification of our transport system and of our heating system. It will be powered by re renewable. In Ireland's case, that will be primarily wind and, and solar. Uh, with a lot of interconnection, I think it'll be, we'll have to balance it over a wider area because that's the, that's the way the European I, I Union am, is I, going. I, I, and we're I, are you in favour, John? Kind of, I think if somebody wants to put a solar panel on the roof, I think that's a great idea. They should go for it. It'll reduce their heating bill. No problem with that. What I have a problem with is Eamon talking about efficiency. Somebody You're who constantly looking back. Would you ever look forward? And I'm, say, I'm looking forward. I'm looking back. You, I'm looking, you know, you have had one chance in the history of the environmental movement, Eamon, mm -hmm. to implement your policies. It was from We've 2007 to 2011. Power, tripled all you, speeds, what you tripled, investment what you, in what you, tripled home what you tripled was the price of car tax, home heating, but is it and all these other things. the economy for poor ahead of the environment? Surely they want to know why people. You must put they the want to know why people don't agree with them. I mean, there are a couple of reasons why people don't agree. You with them. You must put the environment. But surely you must put look, the environment. John Gibbon says if we don't do what he says, there'll be 50 million people left on the planet by by 2100. He said it in his blog the other day. If anyone believes that John Gibbons, who said that in 2010 oil prices are going to go through the roof, is right when he says. 99% of the world's population will be dead I, in 80 years. Can I go back you know, to facts? They're can welcome to, to do that. Yeah. That is a fact. Okay. Can, I he said the word the can I go back to Amen. the word and facts? Because you're throwing out accusations now. That's not an accusation. If people can just, read it wrong. It was point. a vision statement. Calm down. If I could make the point. The European Commission did an analysis of all the different energy responses as we moved to the clean energy transition. They signalled out Ireland as actually being the way to do what we want to do. You didn't say it was the cheapest way to yes, live our lives. It was the cheapest way to do what we want to do. And it's still bloody expensive. And it still hurts this the We're going to have to take a break there. And when I come back, we're going to deal with what's happening on the ground here at home. So we'll take a break now. When Lidl said they were serious about supporting ladies' Gaelic football, they meant it. So far in 2016, Lidl has provided half a million euro worth of prize funding to ladies' Gaelic football teams all over Ireland. That's meant new jerseys and equipment for 145 post-primary schools and cash donations for 150 local clubs. And... Hi, I'm Cleopatra. To help me be at my majestic best, I eat new Kellogg's Ancient Legends. It's made with highly prized ancient grains. Perfect for legends like me. And has nutrients I need for the challenging day ahead. Me. Come in your bones, make yourself. Come and smile. Oh, we all need love, that sweet, sweet love that makes us whole again. We're whole again. We're whole again. We're whole again. Yes, we are whole again. My house has been flooded last year, this year. Are these the effects of climate change that are going to continue to happen in this country? Yeah, yeah. we know that as the earth warms and more evaporation happens, we get more water vapor in the atmosphere, and we're seeing that now over the last 30, 40 years. There's 4% more water vapor in the atmosphere, and that has to fall somewhere. So for Ireland, the impacts of climate change are wet. They're, you know, more storms, more flooding, stronger storms, and sea level rise. And, and we've seen that over the last two winters, and it is costing us about 150 to 200 million a year in insurance claims and government repairs and so climate change is here and now and costing us.
John Gibbons, in, in the break you were saying, we have a bizarre situation when we're, when we're looking at energy policy in Ireland that we're paying through our public service obligation subsidies um, over 100 million a year to Bordenamona and ESB to burn peat in three inefficient power stations. It's an extraordinary thing. We're tearing up the best carbon sinks in Ireland and some of the best um, ecological systems in Europe, tearing them up burning them in furnaces to produce incredibly inefficient energy which is producing huge pollution as well and then we're paying them a hundred million a year two million euros a week being paid off our electricity bills to subsidize a completely inefficient and crazy energy production system that's why i wanted to mention pete eamon you're a big advocate of uh, of wind of wind power and of wave and of solar energy um, Wave Action contacted me, Wave uh, Wind Aware contacted me today and they said, listen, look, wind doesn't always blow. Wind energy can't be stored. Is we would need to electrify our transport system and our heating system. And in that way, we can actually store a lot of that heat. You can store it in car batteries, you can store it in hot water tanks, powered by the wind power when we, when we have it. It's also why we do need to be part of an interconnected system so that if we don't have power here, we could connect to hydro in, in Scandinavia or to other countries and bring in the power and balance it out in that way. The reason why this is an economic opportunity is that that balancing, which, whichever country is good at this new way of doing things, which is balancing variable supply and, and demand, that's where the economic opportunity lies, and particularly for this country. And it's happening. Like companies are investing now at scale and creating employment, particularly in the areas in the west of Ireland where we need to create jobs. This is the big economic opportunity, and we should embrace it. So when you say the big economic opportunity, you're talking about to have more women. We're annoyed. Remember, it's not in my back garden. It's not in your back garden where there's a windmill. Or an interconnector. Yeah, so, I mean, are we doing enough to, well, to, to bring people along? Do, do we want our children to No, no, I'm asking you, are we doing... Uh, yeah, no, no, I, but no I'm we, asking you, do, are we doing enough? I think to sort of to bring the middle ground of people, clearly they're environmentalists as well, to bring them along. To answer that, Charlie, to answer that, and to really kind of open up this. Yeah, we'll open us, it up. Let us go right back to a form of community engagement which is completely different to what we've done but so far. But that hasn't been done up to I now. I think it is about... It hasn't done been done up to now. Yes, and I'm saying it should be done now. But why? You were a minister. Why wasn't it done? Well, because firstly, well, we did in terms of go out to consult. But can I say, just to look forward, what I think we should do, we're in part of a whole... And the and scientific evidence in a rational, calm way, not in a fighting match like we have here. I'll that's bring you in, John, and, I just want and, to and set out the options on a completely rational way, with no perceived notions what the outcome would be. I am confident in those circumstances, the Irish people will make a good call. We should do it in an innovative way, a different form of community consultation. There is an opportunity to that. And the government has said in their programme for government that that's what they want to do. So I think there's a space But what's in a programme for government and what's done on the ground? And just because you add the name climate change to a ministry doesn't mean we're actually one doing thing, something. One of the groups I'd like to have involved in that process is our media. Because I think it's important we do have... People are switched off listening to this, I'm sure. They think they're yep. just shouting at each other. We need a way of telling the story and actually working out on a strategic level. Do we as a country want to be good at this or do we want to opt out? I've, I have confidence, but I would leave it to the people to actually decide that. And I think uh, there are areas of the country and cities that would say to themselves, listen, if we're good at this, we're going to get a jump ahead of the other cities and indeed the other countries. Listen, That's John what McGurk, we need to do. When you were in government and the projects were commenced, was never granted to the people of Mayo or Cavan or Monaghan or Meath who are being lumbered with an interconnector that they don't want. Um, they weren't given that option. You, you provoke, propose that option largely for areas that might vote for you, Eamon, and the rest of the country can go to hell. Um, in terms of what we can do to, 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 to mitigate... In, 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 that is in, utterly ridiculous. It's the absolute truth why that people don't talk. You think, he said, he, he's just saying that I want the rest of the country to go to hell. I couldn't give a damn about the country. I mean, come on. You are there in, as a minister in your job to try and work out what well, you well, think is in the national interest. Well, why interest. is it that you're saying we that some people should have options and other people should have interconnectors imposed upon Can I tell you, can I tell you why, we need, why we need an interconnector north-south, as I see it? Because it you would save us... you need to tell. Well, it's fair here that unites our island. Don't give us that nonsense. You it's politician talk. It's bullshit. There's a road that goes from north to south. An interconnector doesn't unite the island, island any more than a river does. If we don't interconnect our electricity systems, it will cost us an additional... It is costing us 30 million a year because we don't have a properly connected system north and south. We only have one power line across the border. We need more than that to be able to do the balancing that I talked about earlier. John, having and large wind it. farms around the country, mm. would they make a huge difference uh, in relation to our contribution to um, climate change? 
Well, I think... I mean, enormous. That's what they're going to have to be. Mm. Enormous numbers of them scattered all over the place. I don't think anybody wants to cover the entire countryside in wind farms. You have to look at a rational policy. But I would say, uh, to take, again, a small step back on this, how we frame this argument, Charlie, is incredibly important. And maybe the best way I've heard it framed is to say, just imagine for a moment, I'm not sure I believe in meteors. And maybe meteors are, you know, the pixies at the end of the garden. Or maybe maybe it's on a blog said there aren't meteors. Yeah. No, we wouldn't. We would be sitting around the table. We would have military people. We would have environment people. We would have engineers. We would have it's people very, together. We would have civil point. society people together. And what we would be doing is to plan how to first of all, prevent the meteor hitting us, and second of all, what can we do to mitigate? Climate change is the man-made meteor. It's a very Cara, good point. As, as a scientist, in a hundred years' time, are we facing the equivalent of the meteor? Yeah, I absolutely think that if we do nothing, we are looking at the whole Greenland ice sheet melting, you know, we are looking at time, looking backwards and not coming up with solutions and thinking about aggressive action to deal with this. Eamon, I think five or six years ago, I bought a diesel car because I was encouraged to do mm. it. You said it was going to help, you know, climate change was going to help, the, you know, everything, the environment. And, you know, you got cheaper road tax. Now we're being told, no, diesel's out the door. So in a way, sometimes are we being told something that is being disproved maybe five or six years later? I know you were on radio the other day in Morning Ireland. Mm. And you were talking about the health issues. Mm. But there is the environment, you know, we were told five or six years ago that diesel was the way to go. Yeah, we were, yeah, and we were also told by the car companies that they were going to be able to clean up the act. And we found out subsequently that that wasn't true and, and that the, the way they so were testing you know, the cars. So people do lie to us, so therefore people can be cheating well, us yeah, with... Listen, we should admit... There's lots of uncertainties in this, as I said at the very start. There'll be uncertainties on do we want to be part of the solution or do we want to continue doing which we're doing at the moment is not, not but leading... But how do we engage everybody in the country in this process? I we have, we're having a discussion we, about it tonight, need, but it'll move on. It mightn't happen for I another few months. To, I think we need to use the existing structures, the local councils, the PPN networks, which yeah. are there to, to bring people in in consultation. We need to use a lot more civic forums and bringing people in so it doesn't become a fighting match. You have the science presented in a neutral way well, yeah. and then you have the options so, chosen. Do you not accept that, John? That maybe no, I, rather than the, than the heat of, of the rowing, the exchange, that what we need is a proper debate and maybe uh, is it the People's I Constitution, the Constitutional point, Conference. I thought the meteor point was a really good one and really illustrative of the problem with this debate. In 1905 in Galveston, Texas, a hurricane hit, Category 5. 10,000 people were dead in taxes and fuels, built hurricane defences. John, do you believe the meteor is coming, yes or no? I believe that... If you know what I mean. Do you believe it? It's no, coming. I, I, I don't, because I've been listening to it for 30 years, that it's been coming in 2005, in 2004, mm. four, in mm. 2003. It goes back to the very start of this debate. If you believe there's a meteor coming, and you've been listening to these people for the last 30 you years, must. the meteor you should have hit in 1998. All the scientific yeah. evidence is there. You must believe that there's something coming down the Charlie, road against us. Charlie, answer me this question. You asked, me a, you asked me a question. Well, there's a journalist, a politician. Um, you, 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 you asked me a question. If an economist had been telling you, if, if a doctor had told you in 1980 that you had cancer and you'd die in five years well, unless you took action, well, put it this way, you were still alive today, would you believe? Way, I believe that planes you then fly. You had cancer, scientists and, and engineers tell me that planes fly. Mm. And I also believe that when scientists and engineers tell me that climate change slope, stroke global warming is on the way, I actually tend to believe them, to be honest. I well, have to be, you know, You know what, it's it. probably the safe thing to do what they did in Galveston, which is build defences for the meteor. Where was Eamon's policy on flood defences if the, if, if, okay. if the meteor is coming? It didn't happen. John, it's all this time in the sky 10 nonsense. Ten seconds. Right. 30, 10 seconds. We need to drag this conversation out of the Conservative pit. The best Conservative in the, in the world at the moment, Pope Francis said, if we destroy Stop. creation, our creation will destroy us. There you are. Pope Francis at the end of the night. First well, time he's ever quoted Pope. Thanks to our panel. We'll be back in a few minutes to review tomorrow.